so today we have Dan Zhang coming to us from the University of Maryland. Uh, Dan started her uh, career at um, the uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, where she did her undergraduate degree uh, on the Panda X experiment, then continued on to the University of uh, Maryland, where she works for Professor Xiangdong Ji and continued working on the Panda X experiment, um, including both the analysis as well as um, some projects focusing on production of radioactive sources uh, used for calibration in the detector. And today, I believe she's going to be talking to us about um, the commissioning of the Panda X Fortun experiment. And so with that, Dan, when, uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so the first thing in that uh, uh, is my voice like loud enough and clear. Yeah, you sound perfect. Okay, thank you. So let's get started. So today, um, as Mike just uh, introduced, I'll talk about the commissioning round data uh, released by Panax Fordham, speaking of talking about the dark matter search. And here's the outline of my talk today. So I will give you a short introduction part, and then we'll talk about the overview about hot wheel construction of Panax photon experiment. And for the data analysis part, I'll confine the topic on the wind search, including the signal model calibration and our main background uh, in the low energy at the low energy window and how we set our limit and sensitivity. So let's get started. I know that um, probably most of my audience already know either dark matter very well or xenon technology very well, but just for the completeness of my talk today, let's finish this introduction part. So the concept of dark matter was uh, proposed uh, back to 1930s and up until 1970s, uh, when we got the observations on the galaxy rotational curves from different galaxies, we realized that, that the rotational curve of stars outside of the luminous disk are higher than expected. And dark matter can actually provide extra gravitational force needed to support the, the velocity for the stars. So the concept of dark matter started to get well accepted in our community. Later on, more and more astronomical and cosmological evidence join up like gravitational lensing, bullet cluster. And in this century, cosmic microwave background even pinned down the amount of dark matter we expected in our universe. However, what's the nature of dark matter stays as a nano question. It could just be primordial black holes, which are massive astronomical objects that there is no other, no new particle inside, but not seen. It might be axions like, uh, which is initially brought up to solve the strong CP problem in the QCD. And it, or it could be WIMP, which is a new particle on the order of around GeV to TeV. And WIMP, which I'll focus on today, is one of the most promising dark matter candidates because of the so-called WIMP miracle. It is saying a new particle with a mass on the order of around 100 GeV and with the self annihilation uh, level on the weak scale can give us the right amount of dark matter we observe today. And this kind of new particle is also predicted by some, some, some models beyond standard model like supersymmetry. And here's a general status about the spin independent WIMP nucleus searches. The, the region that is constrained best is also in the region that is most promising. And at the lower uh, mass of WIMP, the crystal colorimeters with a lower energy threshold will have better sensitivity compared to uh, xenon detectors. And argon detectors will expect it to get a better sensitivity at the high mass end. And here is an example to give a uh, sense about what kind of signal we expect. So with a uh, cross-section for the spin independent WIMP nucleus scattering on the level of one times uh, uh, 10 to minus 47 centimeters square, 
and with a 100 GV wind mass and a one ton year exposure in the liquid Zeno, we just expect seven events. So it's for sure a real event search. And in order to make the result between different collaborations comparable, we stay with the, stand, the standard halo model. Uh, but which might not be true because re in recent years, we know that by following some old uh, stellars in a, a Milky Way, there, the dark matter may be a string, but we'll stay with the standard model, uh, standard halo model of the velocity. And the wings are expected to be non-relativistic and the energy deposition in this scattering we expected is to be uh, smaller or on the order of around 50 keV NR, like NR is for nuclear recalling. And so here is a quick a recap about the principle about how a liquid xenon temple junction chamber works. So here after a particle comes in and interact with the Zena atom, like there is a prompt scintillation light generated and collected by the top and the bottom array PMTs or light sensors. And the ionization signal survived as free electrons are drifted upward in a electric field. And after the elect free electrons reaches to the liquid gas interface, another stronger extraction electric field just uh, take uh, the free the electrons out and generate a second proportional scintillation light we call it S2. And these are the two main observables in the liquid xenon temper ejection chamber. And we we care two basically we care two kinds of uh, physical physics events in the uh, low energy and the NR nuclear recoil and electron recoil. So like our target signal wind belongs to the uh, nuclear recoil, which uh, interact with nucleus of Xena and the gammas and betas are interacting with electrons outside of the nucleus of, uh, of uh, of the uh, the electrons outside of the nucleus. So the good point of the, the advantages of, of using temporal traction chamber is that it's capable of uh, reconstruct the, the position in a three-dimensional way and we can do a volume visualization effectively to cut off a bunch of uh, material backgrounds uh, coming out from the side, coming all the way outside from the detector. And we also rely on a good separation of uh, between ER and NR by looking at the ratio of S2 over S1, which is the ionization yield over the scintillation yield to suppress a great, the great amount of uh, electron backgrounds in our detector. And here is about a sense of the energy threshold of liquid xenon detector. Basically, a couple of photon electrons detected correspond to 1 keV EE. The subscript EE is for the um, e electron recalling energy only. And here is a, another estimation. Around 50 keV NR only have around 20% energy deposit into scintillation and ionization. And 80% of that uh, energy deposition crunched into heat and not seen by the liquid xenon detector. And so here is a basic introduction to our collaboration. So our collaboration is called PANAX and it stands for Particle and Astrophysical Xenon Experiments. The collaboration was established back to 2009 and now it's already uh, 13 years old. And it took more than five years for PANAX-1 to happen. And it took another one and a half year to, for the upgradation from PANAX-1 to PANAX-2. And for PANAX-4, uh, actually all the infrastructures and detectors are upgraded. It took another two and a half years. So here is a location of the lab of the site. So PANAX is the lab itself located at the Sichuan province around the middle of China and along a very beautiful river called the Yalong River. And this is the uh, mountain, the Jinping Mountain, which shields the cosmic rays. And Panax photon experiment happened at this 
uh, green cell site located right at the middle of the tunnel. Uh, so, and besides um, PANAX, there are other uh, multi-town liquid xenon detectors uh, taking uh, in the data taking phase or will happen in the future. So Xenon Entang is and LZ are taking their data are, and are expected to release the first scientific round this year. And in the near future, we'll, uh, we, we will expect the next so we'll use enriched uh, Xenon 136 to search for neutrino less double beta decay. And in the far future, speaking of dark matter search, uh, people are talking about Darwin with 40 ton liquid now, but it's uh, it's far from now. Okay, so now let's get into the part about uh, the hardware construction of Panax photon. Here is the layout of the lab overview. So our detector, our temperature projection chamber sits right at the middle of the water tank shield. And the workspace is right above the water tank. We had our distillation tower, which is uh, designed to reduce the creep down 85, but now it's verified very efficient in removing tritium in Xena as well. So here is the clean room and our workspace. We have our electronics and data acquisition system, our cogenics and circulation system. And this is the door of the clean room. And we got our uh, uh, storage, ga xenon gas storage right up besides the clean room. So the here is a scale of the detector. Detec the detector itself is around a one cubic in size and holding uh, 3.7 ton liquid xenon in a, uh, in a sensitive region. And we use uh, around 350 to 400 uh, three inch PMTs in total. And here's uh, like milestones about Panax Photon project. So back to 18, 2018 April, like we, we, on, we just got the permission to start the infrastructure and it took an, a, more than a year to finish the structure. And, and the offline distillation of Xena and the detector installation are were going on in parallel for another year. And the data I'm go going to talk about this time covered uh, from uh, which, which it was taken in 2020, November to 2021, April. And it's now back into a data taking phase after uh, around half a year tritium removal campaign. So here's some photos about the construction. So this is our uh, lab hall and the water tank cape. And the side view of the water tank, which is about three or four flo floors high. And here's the pure water purification system, the class 10,000 clean room outside of the class 1,000 clean room, and the radon removal system to reduce the radon level in the uh, of the air in the clean rooms. And here's the gas storage system and our cooling bus and the uh, Krypton 85 distillation tower. And here is a view of the detector of the TPC. You can see the Teflon holders, the Cooper shipping rings, and the Capton holding the resistors allow the, the field gauge and our PMT array and my collaborators installing our detector. And here's the overview of the packed uh, compact uh, lab clean room. And our detector sits around five or six meters under this electronics hut. And this is the photo taking at inside the clean room and looking downwards to uh, our outer vessel of the detector. And uh, we, this is the whole electronics, uh, a, a closer view of the, of the electronics uh, pa panel. And we actually add into triggerless mode, which is an upgrade, upgradation compared to PanX2. So um, here is the calibration system. Basically, we have to uh, we have a injection calibration panel to inject the gaseous calibration source like Krypton 83M and Redon 220, and we had uh, calibration tubes 
uh, outside of the inner vessel, inner stainless steel vessel to guide through the solid uh, sources like MB. And it's the first time for PanX to use deuteron deuteron uh, fusion neutron to calibrate the, the nuclear recalling uh, signals. And this is the beam line attached to the outer vessel guiding the neutrons through the water into, into the detector. And so I just said in the outline part that I'm gonna confine the topic of data analysis to wind search. And we the the most interesting uh, signal region is at the energy uh, at the energy threshold window. And the, the signal before talking about that part calibration, I will first talk about some other general detector calibrations. After the calibration part, I will talk about the MEM background budget and our limit and sensitivity setting. So the whole uh, running condition was quite stable. Speaking of the um, high voltages added onto the temple projection chamber, especially the gate high voltage, which is used uh, to extract out the electrons at in, uh, at the liquid gas interface. However, we have to tune down the high voltage of the castle to avoid excessive discharges along the time. And we further separated this set, even if they have the uh, same uh, high voltage com configuration because of a different um, ER backgrounds, coming from the readout progenist uh, why, why, about whether we turn on a distillation tower connected to the detector. And um, the electron lifetime, which described the free electrons survived in the way drifting up is used as a, as a parameter to estimate the data quality. So the bottom line is that the electron lifetime should be longer than the largest drifting time in our detector for the signals which are all the way coming uh, coming down from the cathode and which is around 840 microseconds. And that will apply it as a hard cut for our data as election lifetimes. And you can also see how the sub data sets span along the time. And the, the electron lifetimes, which are estimated by the de excitation of Xenon 131M, and also the alpha decay of Redon 222 are pretty consistent with each other. And so um, the detector parameters are first uh, calibrated by the monoenergetic peaks because of the simplicity in reconstructing the energy for, for those monoenergetic peaks. It's the, and the energy equals to the work function, which is the uh, average uh, energy needs to produce a, a ion electron pair inside the liquid xenon times the scintillation quantas and ionization quantas. And we got the photon detection efficiency as a parameter to correct the real scintillation quanta from the S1. And we got two parameters for the ionization part. So by linearly fit about the amount of charge yield, which is the total ionization uh, generated in unit energy and the, the light yield, which is the total scintillation generated in unit ener uh, energy, we actually can find out the PDE and SCG times E as a whole. And the subsuit B here means for means that we actually use the bottom PMT at only bottom PMT collected charges only in the S2. This is because it has a more linear behavior covered a wider energy range. Like because we are using the peaks coming from more than 400 keV and all the way extended to around 10 keV. In that sense, we wanna uh, more linear responses. And we just keep using S2B for consistency. 
in order to separate these um, two parameters, so SCG is for single electron gain, which means there is an amplification at the liquid gas interface that together come together with another electron extraction efficiency. And SEG can be figured out by looking at the smallest S2 um, showing up in our detector. And because we, we, are, we care about the S2B, S2 bottom only, so we use the S2 over S2B ratio to scale the SEG as well. And here is a summary about um, the detector parameters um, of the data taken of the five data sets. And basically because of the short duration for set one and set three, so they actually just use the detector parameters from the closest data sets. And now we are like, we are ready to look at the low energy part. So the first thing we care about is the expectation of, sig of our NR signals. And that NR signals are calibrated by the deuteron deuteron fusion neutron and MB alpha N neutrons. So, so both of them actually provided enough statistics all the way up, up to 80 kV NR and enough for our use. And we found out what's the expected medium line in a band as well as the spreading in a band. And we define an NR acceptance, which means we cut off the outliers, which below the purple line. And this part is not inside our, uh, like the, the data showing up below this purple line won't show up as kinetics. And besides the nuclear recallings, we, we know that we will have a lot of uh, ER backgrounds as beta decays in the low energy end. So we calibrate the electron recoil signals at the low energy, uh, at the low energy window with read on 220 progenies. And this is the band of the ER signals and with the blue solid line as the medium and the dash, dash blue line as the band spreading. And we actually rely on the difference in S2 over S1 in ER and NR to suppress the ER backgrounds. And the, the NR media actually is also shown here as the magenta line. However, they are not like 100% separate. So the leakage events of ER, which leaked into the main region of NR is a parameter that we can use to estimate the backgrounds coming into our search window. So if we define a, a cut and count search window between the uh, magenta line and the purple line, there's still some leftovers coming from ER. And this part, like estimated by the read on 220 calibration events is that it's estimated to be 0.43%, which is like as expected. And for the signal, model building, actually, we got uh, the help from NASA 2 which is, uh, stands for Noble Element Simulation Technique. It's a phenomenological model describes the, how the yields happening after the energy deposition. Instead of a direct uh, connection from the energy deposition to the observables S1 and S2, it got some more physics correct uh, intersteps. Like we got the degree of freedom of the adjusting in the recombination of the originally produced um, ionization, the, the ionization, which are just uh, the ion electron pairs. Part of them are recombined and contributed as scintillation S1 instead of becoming S2. And the medium of recombination as well as the spread of the recombination uh, is enough to represent the behavior of the bands. And these are like how well our calibration data constrain the signal model, which is shown as the 
red band here. Basically, the center of the recombination ratio is confined very well. And the uncertainty showing up in the fluctuation or fluctuation in the recombination ratio reflects the statistic error in the calibration data because uh, we only got around 1,000 to 3,000 events as calib calibration band, which shown up, which leads to the error band here in our signal model calibration. And the reason we want to use NEST is that actually the, the main calibration data taken was under a, a 93 volts per centimeter, but we had some data which are some dark matter data which are taken under 127 volt, uh, volt per centimeter. So we want to extend our uh, signal model by using NEST. And the consistent between our data and the NASA model just uh, give us a legitimate belief that, oh, we can't use NASA to extend the estimations. And here is a more, I think it's a more clear view about what's the difference between our calibrated NASA model and the original one. So the original one is like with a lighter color. Basically, um, their model has very successfully predicted that the overlap between NRs and ERs, and we are confident to use their, uh, the global fit by NEST to extend to different uh, electric fields. And here is a more uh, specific view at how well the calibration data agrees with the uh, calibrated model for all the three groups of data, including deuteron deuteron fusion, neutrons, MB alpha and neutrons, and radon 220 progeny betas profiled onto S1 and S2b. So um, after the calibration, we now get uh, our model, and here's an uh, expectation about our signal and I, I, I use a, the, I presented the example with a, a 100 GeV wind with a um, energy spectrum here and it will it should be shown up in our detector if it is it's there and have enough statistics with a probability distribution function as shown here. And the saturated um, detection efficiency is, 78% at 40 keV NR. That's basically a uh, saturated uh, detection efficiency in our detector. And so the background budget at the low energy end can be separated into three main parts. As I just uh, already said, we expected to have betas as electron recalling backgrounds. And neutrons, which are used to calibrate our signals, are just uh, very similar to our signals expect uh, ex besides the little difference in the energy spectrum. And we also expect to have some backgrounds because of the detector effects. So let's get started with the uh, uh, ER background part. And the radon 222 is very universal because of the radon emanation from materials according to the uh, uranium-238. Uh, and this um, low energy end is mainly contributed by the beta decay of lead-214. And it's estimated by the upstream uh, alpha coming from polonium-218 and a coincidence in the downstream. So we are saying the, uh, the level of this beta will for sure between these upstream and downstream um, estimations. And it's estimated to be six times better than our last detector. And the Krypton 85, which used to be the worst, uh, like the most uh, distinct backgrounds in PANX2, uh, was successfully reduced uh, by 20%, uh, 20 times with the distillation campaign. And in our data set, it's estimated by a coincidence uh, signal, which, which happened with a very small branch ratio, but it, it, it's almost a background-free channel to identify the Krypton-85. And we only find four events in our um, fiducial volume as this 
uh, beta gamma coincidence coming from crypto, Krypton 85. And for sure, we, we had um, non, a non negligible amount of ER backgrounds coming from the material uh, just around surrounding our detector, which will more gathered at the border region, but leaked into the center region. Compare, uh, compared to the readout to 20 uh, progenies, uh, it's a minor part. And the Xenon 1, 126, uh, 27 is active, uh, is cosmologically activated during transportation on the ground. And it has a peak at 5.2 uh, 5 keV. And we used uh, another branch at 33 keV to estimate the amount uh, at the low energy part. And because of this uh, 33 keV used, so that's basically the reason why we choose our S1 to have a specific around 135 PE cut as our search window for WIMP because we have already used this um, peak. And here is like tritium. We actually don't have any other independent uh, measurement of the tritium. And this is the event just showing up as our final candidate. And the, the result of the estimation of the tritium level in our detector is also coming from the final limit set fitting. And the radioactivity or the level of tritium is, is totally flo floating in the final analysis. Uh, and our detector basically is the is detecting tritium itself in the whole uh, circulation. And so besides um, ER, let's start to talk about the NR backgrounds. So NR is almost degenerated with the WIMP nuclear scattering. And we, ha we have tried many efforts to constrain the neutron estimation. And actually neutron in our detector carries energy on the level of MeV coming from the uh, energy of the energy states in nucleus. And MeV level neutron will have around centimeter mean free paths in liquid xenon. Just by saying we only care about single scattering new, uh, NRs, it can cut off a large amount of neutron events, but we still got uh, some leftovers. And that leftover can be estimated by comparing the fraction goes into single uh, scattering neutron and multi-scattering neutron, just a, a branch ratio like method. And also um, for the neutron events, they may activate the xenons and the DD excitation of xenons have high energy gamma rays, which, which shown up at a very clean window in the dark matter run. So this uh, window can also be used to estimate the ratio uh, that will contaminate the low energy window. And this is our second method to estimate the neutron events. And also we preserved the same estimation similar to uh, yeah, material backgrounds, we use general four based simulation, putting the geometry and radioactivity level, which were measured by another high purity germanium detector first and put in the radioactivities of material and got the estimation of neutron backgrounds inside the detector. And in total, we expected to have uh, this uh, single scattering neutron on the level of one event in the uh, in the window we defined. And the neutron X are those double-sided events, but actually got the first, first one happen below the cathode. So it's not, uh, the S2 is not collected and it's mimicked as single scattering events. So in total, there, there is around one event expected in a detector uh, region, uh, which will coming from neutron. And here is some 
detector effects. So, so like the surface background. So these events are coming from the PTFE wall, wall the Teflon wall surrounding the liquid xena, and they are happening at the wall, and we know that. However, there is an uncertainty in the position construction. So in so after we got our fiducialization volume, there's still some leakage amount for the surface backgrounds. And it's like, uh, if we cut the fiducial volume better, it will have a smaller amount of um, surface background, but we'll, we'll lose too many exposures. So there is a trade-off uh, effect. And accidental backgrounds are coming from the coincident pairing between single S1s and single S2s to mimic into our, um, our like some physical events. And the, the single S1s are likely coming from the dark rays in a PMT. And single S2s are like some of the single S2s are coming from the free electrons just uh, stay right under the liquid gas interface and pumped out very randomly. And this part actually compared to the neutron or the surface backgrounds, it's, it's a large amount at the, uh, in the region with S1 smaller than 10 PE. And here's how we optimize our fiducial volume. And all the events shown in up here are toy model events. So we modeling the material ER backgrounds and the uniform ER as like read on 222 progenies and the black, board, uh, black dots are the neutron simulated events. And we are we define the figure of merit as the square root of background events over the mass of uh, Zena included in the fiducial volume. And the final uh, fiducial volume is defined by the red dashed line, uh, including 3.67 uh, uh, ton of liquid Zena. So here is a total budget summary about um, the background in our commission run. So instead of using a lot of like individual estimation for the ERs, we actually use a sideband estimated ER because it gives us a smaller uncertainty. And all the, most of the backgrounds have, I have discussed uh, uh, before, except the uh, like Xena 136, which have a, uh, have a ER spectrum and have a non-negligible contribution to the to our background and brown eight coherent nuclear scattering also will show up in the search window with a negligible amount as background budget. So here is a total as like expectation for the events below a non medium. So like if we we are think we think about the experiment in a cut and count way and we expect the most of the events will or most of the backgrounds will coming from ER leakage. And then we while we look at the real candidates data like in the defined search window, if we look at the total events number, which are basically most are coming from uh, ERs, like compared to our our sum is pretty consistent. But if we look at the region defined below NR medium and our uh, NR acceptance cut, it's sort of uh, a, a, a obvious that we'll expect uh, around a one sigma low uh, downward fluctuation uh, here. Like we only have six events, but we expected to see 10 events. And those six, events below a medium looks good, like speaking of the vertexes in our detector. And so now, uh, can I have a about, oh yeah, I still got time. So now let's talk about the profile likelihood ratio analysis we use to set the limit and the sensitivity. And this, the structure of the 
uh, methodology has already uh, is also included in the white paper, and we want to follow the same algorithm to make the result comparable. But it's true that everyone needs to con construct our own likelihood, and we follow a conventional unbeing likelihood, basically comparing the S1 and S2B for each event to the probability distribution of each component, including our expected signal and estimated backgrounds. And each background as independent, which are which has been independent constrained, will have a nuisance parameter saying the variance of the event number for that background. Excluding tritium, we don't we don't we don't need and we don't have any independent measurement. And neutron and neutron X basically are neutral are coming from the material backgrounds and they are correlated. So they share the same nuisance parameter on the event number and the others have their own independent measurements. We also include our signal model uh, calibration uh, uncertainty, as I just said in the nest model adjusting, adjusting part uh, in the likelihood of fitting. So, which is marked as the magenta color. And here is the, the best fit of our data. So in the lines here, there's no signal line because our best fit is signal equals to zero. And here is a pro project, projected uh, best fit onto S1 and the P value um, of the fitting with, with back one only model is 0.71, which is within uh, in the in the pre in the well defined region that's saying there is no access found in our data. And looking at the likelihood ratio, like between different components, in our uh, six uh, golden events below an NR medium, we can see that most of them are regarded, are expected to be ER leakage from tritium or uh, the so-called flat, flat ER. So here is the final result showing up as the limit, um, which is this work is marked by the red line here. And we are happy to, uh, to release the data set saying that the sensitivity has been improved by 2.6 times, and our limit is 1.2 times stronger than Xena one town around 40 GV. And I think um, this, is, this is all I wanna say about for uh, our commissioning data today. And with a 0 0.63 town year exposure, we have released uh, the strongest uh, spin independent wing nuclear interaction constraint. And uh, also uh, we had we, we had finished, we had finished an offline tritium removal campaign in the last year and back into the data taking phase now. So let's stay tuned for future data release. I think at that moment, we may comment more on the Xena one town low energy ER access. Yeah, okay. So I think thanks for um, listening and having me today. Great, thank you for the excellent talk, Dan. Um, so with that, I guess we can open up to the floor for any questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm not looking at the same. So I don't see any hand raised, but so can I, I can actually start with a, or actually I see Dave's hand is up. Dave, you wanna go? Yeah, so a uh, very nice talk uh, and great results. Uh, I guess I'll ask the annoying question about the tritium because um, we're oh. all excited to see what it looks like at low energy. I mean, so how much lower does your tritium have to be uh, to see a signal kind of at the sensitivity level? Sorry if I missed that. So, um, you're, you're, so uh, I think the question is that uh, how how much uh, tritium we gonna reduce in order to say something on xenon one tons result? Is that the case? Yeah. Uh, so, so should I expect that xenon one tons result is a few events per bin here at the lowest? Yeah. 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 
So basically, we're gonna reduce it onto non like non detectable amount to like make our data like comparable to their clean level because our um like read on to 22 which is which is the final background which is the final background hard to kill are around the same level and our so far is slightly higher than theirs so but we'll just uh, gonna like we, we had a uh more than two ton uh, fiducial volume show with a longer time and we can at least uh, say a double check on their uh data with another year because now the treating has been removed <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah okay great thank you yeah thank you okay do we have any other questions from the audience okay i don't see any hands for the moment but actually i had a quick question about so i think on slide 25 when you were talking about the electron lifetime i had a quick question Oh, one moment. So it's uh, um, 25, slide 25. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like it improved quite a bit after, I don't know, like January or whatever. Yeah. One of, what changed? Is it just from cycling? <laughs> Not enough times, or was there something else that changed? Yeah, yeah. We actually changed the circulation pump, and <laughs> and that just uh, make the election lifetime uh, election lifetime back to like the beginning, and we have to like wait for a while again. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I just missed that you changed the Oh, I, 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 I actually just uh, showed the slides, and I haven't like talked about it. Thanks for like pointing it out. <laughs> Yeah, just the, the big jump, I was curious, but no, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Uh, uh, okay, it looks like Akko has his hand raised. Akko? Yeah. Hey, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I had a question. So you mentioned something about some issues with the high voltage. So I was wondering, can you explain a little bit what you know what you think happened and whether the electric field you're running at now is impacting your reconstruction efficiency at all? Um. So are, are you asking about like whether the cathode high voltage affect our like signal detection efficiency while while it's going down? Is that, is that am I getting yeah. question? Yeah. So the the quick answer is actually we haven't seen very uh, obvious uh like um change in the scintillation and ionization yield like within two percent i'd like to say uh and i think the reason is that even like with a smaller uh cathode um with, with a smaller drifting electric field as long as it's large enough to bring a, a great amount of electrons upward we we are able to detect that signal then it's not a very severe uh severe thing to have have a sort of smaller number in the cathode in in the cathode high voltage and actually our uh high voltage speaking of the drifting field is is still uh, like larger than xenon one times value like they were running at 80 volts per centimeters for for quite quite a a long time and we are actually starting from like 120 volts per centimeter and now down to 90 uh, volts per centimeter and the good thing in that uh, like now it's still it, it keeps the same it keeps so uh, we, we keeps we keeps the same we keep the same uh, cathode high voltage so under this level like everything works well and also, we we also very surprised at how good the next model can predict our data. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, in which case, uh, thank you again for the excellent talk, Dan, and. Uh, I think that's that's it for today. And uh, we appreciate you coming. We were happy to have you come. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I had a great time with you guys. Okay.